Is peace possible in South Sudan? They fought for independence from Sudan, and when they got it, government forces and rival rebels warred with each other for years. Now, another power-sharing deal has been signed, but will it hold this time? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Mohammed Jamjoum. The warring leaders in South Sudan are giving peace another chance. But is the agreement signed on Sunday in Sudan finally the one which will end five years of civil war? Many ceasefire deals have been signed, then collapsed within hours. And the fighting, which has killed tens of thousands and uprooted millions, didn't stop. Now, a second power-sharing agreement has been struck between President Salva Kiir and rebel leader Riek Machar. The president says he's confident this one won't collapse. We'll get to our guest shortly, but first, Hibba Morgan has more. Another agreement signed between South Sudan's government and opposition groups, and renewed hopes of ending five years of war. This time, regional countries brokered more than a month of direct discussions in the Sudanese capital Khartoum between the leaders of the warring sides. The civil war started less than three years after South Sudan gained independence from Sudan in 2011. President Salva Kiir accused his former vice president, Rick Machar, of attempting a coup. Since then, tens of thousands have been killed, and a third of the 12 million population forced from their homes. The latest agreement gives an eight-month pre-transitional period, after which Rick Machar is due to return as vice president. The deal stipulates 35 ministers in a transitional government, 20 from Kiir's party and nine from Machar's. The rest represent other parties. Parliament will have 550 legislators, including 332 from Kiir's group and 128 from Machar's. Opposition leader Rick Machar says the latest deal will bring peace. A power-sharing deal signed three years ago saw Machar return to his position months later, only for fighting to soon restart. Some, such as Flora Yawa, who saw what happened then, are cautiously optimistic now. When the 2016 fighting happened, we were trapped. So much has changed since the war. My sister lost her husband, and we also lost another relative. We couldn't do anything. We just stayed at home. Now we just want peace. Around 6 million South Sudanese rely on foreign aid to survive. With the economy devastated by war, many are hanging their hopes on this agreement. Hiba Morgan, Al Jazeera. All right, at just over seven years old, South Sudan is the world's youngest country. It gained independence from Sudan following a referendum in 2011. A political dispute two years later between President Salva Kiir and his vice president, Riek Machar, turned into war. A ceasefire agreement was reached in 2014, but it didn't hold for long. Peace talks and deals all failed. The first power-sharing peace agreement was signed in 2015, which saw the return of Machar as first vice president. The deal collapsed within a year. Fighting resumed in the capital, Juba, and Machar fled the country. All right, we'd like to stress that this program made several attempts to invite a spokesman for the South Sudanese government on the program today, but nobody was available to speak to us. So let's bring in our panel for the show. Joining us via Skype from Nairobi, Deo Gumba, researcher at the Institute for Security Studies office in Kenya. In Washington, D.C., Ali Verji, visiting researcher at the United States Institute of Peace. And in London, Ahmed Suleiman, a researcher in the Africa program at Chatham House, Welcome to you all. Now, Ali, I want to start with you. Sunday's deal is just the latest ceasefire. It's the latest power-sharing agreement. What makes it different this time? Any hope that it will last? I think it's first important to note that this isn't the final deal. Even, even though it's been reported that way, there will still be subsequent negotiations on security matters. The second point to make is that this deal does not repeal the earlier 2015 peace agreement uh, that you mentioned earlier that is still in effect, but it's not clear what exactly will be implemented from that and what will be implemented from this agreement and how one selects between those things. The third is that it sets up a very long timetable for actual implementation. And so in these eight months that are being talked about, a lot could happen, a lot could change. There is also a limitation because not everyone who is fighting has been involved in the process in Khartoum. 
and not everyone who signed yesterday appears to be fully representative of their own parties as well. So we can expect over the next few days to see uh, various statements, perhaps some denunciations of the agreement. There's still a long way to go before this agreement leads South Sudan to peace. Dale, let me ask you, uh, many observers are saying that the structure of this agreement thus far looks very similar to the accord that was signed in 2016, and thus they are worried that it's going to collapse. What do you think? Uh, I would say that it's, not, uh, it's uh, different this time because of uh, the commitment of the regional governments, uh, the commitment of the parties themselves, because uh, there is a lot of... Uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, optimism from the groups uh, that uh, this time it's not going to collapse. Uh, the main groups, that is. Uh, there are, uh, of course, smaller groups that cannot be ignored and uh, that could cause uh, serious problems, as uh, uh, my colleague has just noted. But I think the optimism of the involvement of the entire region, remember that this, uh, this agreement was signed in, uh, was uh, negotiated in almost all the three, uh, all the four main cities of this region. So uh, that makes it a little bit different from the rest, although it is uh, the same in letter uh, and, and, and spirit almost. Ahmed, you heard Deo there just talk about regional involvement. Certainly, uh, you know, neighbors of South Sudan far more involved in this deal than they have been in other deals. Do you think that that is going to help this out more this time? Well, I think that the neighboring countries, the countries within IGAD, have always been extremely important to the IGAD peace process deal. I mean, what seems to set this current peace deal apart is that you have largely Sudan and uh, Uganda leading the process. And this process has been taken in called the Khartoum process. Uh, so it's essentially the leverage that the Sudanese government provides on the parties who are signing, as well as the Ugandan government, which has been a strong supporter of President Kiir's South Sudanese government during the, this period, uh, that we'll see if, if the deal can be a, a one that lasts and one that holds. And of course, uh, what we do know is that there are important economic incentives for both parties. Uh, you know, there's an economic crisis, of course, in South Sudan, but there's also one in Sudan on the promise that some of the oil uh, fields in, in Unity State largely will be reconstituted uh, and, 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 and start producing oil again to feed into the, the economies of Sudan and South Sudan uh, is an important part of this this deal. Uh, what we don't know, for example, is how that oil money is going to be spent, what the oversight over that kind of uh, financing is going to be, whether or not it's going to go when it goes into an escrow account, whether or not the international community will have any oversight over that. So there are lots of areas of this deal where potentially it could be a success because of the high level engagement of the region, but also perhaps it could fall short because of their engagement. Uh, Ali, you just heard Ahmed talk about, you know, the issue of oil and, you know, the ink was barely dry on the signing of this accord before President of Sudan Omar Bashir was talking about the fact that he foresaw that oil would be flowing from South Sudan starting in September. First of all, I want to ask you, do you think that's realistic? And secondly, Sudan, of course, has been accused of meddling, you know, in the war in South Sudan, in the conflict. So can they be trusted as a guarantor of a peace deal? Well, of course, there is already oil flowing. There has been oil flowing continually. There are two main areas. Ahmed just referred to unity. The other area of oil production was largely unaffected by the conflict. And so the hope would be that in this short time, you could somehow rehabilitate the damaged oil fields and turn up production in that respect. I think that's actually going to take much longer than anybody has indicated whether the various oil ministers are indeed President Bashir. So any immediate impact in terms of oil revenue will, will take uh, much uh, longer. Uh, of course, oil prices are rising generally, and that may increase revenue uh, to both South Sudan and Sudan in that respect. There is a long history between Sudan and South Sudan, which makes their relationship fraught because of the border, because of water, because of oil, because of the migration of people. 
The idea that Sudan is somehow a neutral mediator, I think we all can agree that that isn't the case. But that doesn't mean that Sudan can't necessarily be uh, a force to influence a process more positively. I think there are two limitations. One is that Sudan's own interests can't really be separated from the possibility that it isn't a neutral or isn't a trusted mediator, let's say, between all of the South Sudanese elements inside the country. Certainly, there is a, a degree of what so Sudanese interests more than anything else. But also, this idea that there is a way to compel compliance is something that is extremely difficult. So if the government of South Sudan or the new government of South Sudan doesn't live up to certain elements of the deal, what can the Sudanese do about it? Part of the problem of these peace processes is that the compliance, the mechanism for enforcement, oversight, whatever you want to call it, um, doesn't necessarily lead to concrete actions. We see that now with violations of the ceasefire, for example, where there have been violations documented by the regional monitors from these same countries, and yet there's very little action or consequences as a result of those violations. So the deal itself has the same limitation, has the same problem. I don't see how the Sudanese can do anything different in that respect on the basis of the current framework. Dio, the civil war in South Sudan has been very complicated from the start. It's been fueled by, by uh, personal and ethnic rivalries. Um, I want to ask you, what role does tribalism play in this conflict? Um, it's, it, it plays uh, the same role that uh, it has played in uh, several uh, African countries. Uh, when I look at the example of my own country, Kenya, uh, even at this stage of independence, uh, you still have those uh, ethnic interests coming, uh, to play, coming into play in uh, uh, a lot of uh, issues that are being discussed at the national level. So when you have elections, then you will see that coming up. So when you look at uh, South Sudan, therefore, you're going to see that uh, when it comes to uh, the division of resources, because this is a country that is just beginning to rebuild, and each one of those ethnic groups is going to want uh, a very good share of the cake and uh, I, I think that if that is not carefully planned and carefully done, it is likely to cause uh, a lot of problems. The other cake that, uh, uh, apart from the economic, uh, uh, the, the, the economic um, issues, there is also the political issues, the division of uh, political offices, uh, the division of uh, appointments into government. Those are also uh, very important, and they will be looked at uh, uh, very, very critically by the parties that are involved. They will want to see how many of their people, how many of their politicians and leaders are represented in those governments, uh, in, in, in the government and in uh, the departments and ministries of the government. So from the economic perspective and the political perspective, that factor of ethnic uh, rivalry uh, or uh, ethnic uh, uh, balancing is very, very important. Ahmed, in March, a UN panel of investigators said dozens of senior army officers in South Sudan have likely committed crimes against humanity, including mass rapes and civilian murders. Do you expect that now there will be any accountability? Will we see trials going forward? Will anybody uh, be held responsible for these crimes? It's very difficult to say. Um, there is a provision in the uh, 2015 agreement for the establishment of an African Union hybrid court. Uh, I have to say that uh, any sort of progress towards the establishment of that court uh, has been minimal uh, in, the, in the last three years and, and also uh, in the interests of, of holding peace, uh, several of the sides have suggested that uh, if, if that kind of court were to be established, uh, that it would be something which would prevent peace from, from first of all being established and then being maintained. Um, of course, we have seen uh, quite recently uh, UN Security Council sanctions, including in individual sanctions uh, on, on some commanders. Uh, but, but ultimately, these have uh, fallen short and been lacking as well, in that we 
the individuals that we have seen that have been targeted uh, weren't necessarily sanctioned when the sanctions were, were, were included. So we're you know, talking about people such as the Informi Information Minister, Michael McQuay, um, the Defence Minister, Kwame Nguyen Jack. Uh, these ministers haven't been, whereas, uh, you know, previous commanders in the army, including uh, Paul Malong, who's currently now an opposition figure, uh, are those who have had sanctions placed on them. So in terms of rep uh, reparations and, and looking at the future, uh, it, it really will be a matter of political will. Uh, and as we say, now looking at the, the nature of the way the... Um, the peace process and the peace deal has been signed. Uh, we don't know the level of international oversight over this peace deal, what, uh, what the international community, how they are going to engage in this. What we do know is that the interests of the region and, and of Sudan and Uganda are primarily driving this peace deal, uh, and perhaps uh, those issues may take a back seat. Dio Ahmed was just talking about political will. You were speaking a moment ago about the complexity of this conflict. Look, even if the politicians adhere to this framework, to this agreement, are they going to be able to keep their fighters in line? That's an interesting one. Um, first of all, we have seen the smaller groups uh, saying that uh, they are, uh, there they, is serious lack of consistency in the allocation of power sharing. Uh, so, um, we see that from there that there is a, a group that is uh, disgruntled right from the start. Um, and uh, a lot of times uh, there are also uh, interests within the group. So even though the leaders uh, like Riek Machar and uh, um, Salva Kiir have, have signed uh, uh, these agreements and uh, the are, uh, you know, um, waxing lyrical about uh, the prospects and uh, their confidence that uh, it's not going to collapse this time round, uh, there is uh, a possibility that there are certain interests within their groups that could go against uh, their wish. Uh, the example has been given of Paul Malone, who is now in the opposition. Um, in the last, uh, the, the last time, uh, uh, fighting broke out in 2016. Paul Malone was very much at the center of it all, and he was uh, representing some of the interests that then went against uh, the, 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 that went against the spirit of uh, of togetherness or of having a, a unity government. So that example could be seen in other interests that could come up uh, and, and that could uh, be, become spoilers of uh, this uh, uh, peace agreement. Ali, the U.S. Uh, has backed South Sudanese independence. Uh, they gave billions of dollars in aid over the years. But uh, just earlier this year, America was warning South Sudan that their support might end if the war there didn't. Is this one of the reasons why this peace deal was coming together? I mean, what role is the U.S. playing in all of this right now? Well, I think the reasons for the peace deal coming together have a lot more to do with the regional interests, but also the government, the sitting government's own desire to maintain uh, legitimacy and need an extension, need some way to hold on to office, and a peace deal obviously provides that. It's less about the, uh, the U.S. role in that respect. I think the United States is very frustrated with the peace process. It's frustrated with the South Sudanese. It issued a statement, the White House issued a statement not long ago saying it was concerned at the direction the peace process was taking. I think the concerns remain. I think the, there's a great deal of skepticism over whether power sharing is the right approach. I should acknowledge that as somebody who was involved in the earlier mediations, we did pursue a power sharing approach. I think the fact it failed is good evidence to suggest it shouldn't be tried again in a very, very similar fashion. 
that new innovation is needed. I think the United States is upset that there hasn't been more substantive progress in terms of the humanitarian situation, in terms of addressing the conflict. And so there is a concern uh, that this political process isn't going to solve the problems and therefore needs to be reconsidered, uh, although there isn't clarity within the administration about how one might go about doing that. And so clearly supporting the region has been the basic principle of the last few years. That to some extent remains, but there are still concerns. Ahmed Ali was talking about humanitarian concerns just then, and I want to ask you to expand on that because millions of South Sudanese depend on foreign aid to survive. And aid agencies have worried in the past about donor fatigue. If this peace deal falls through, or if this iteration of the peace deal falls through, will that make it that much harder uh, for aid to be flowing into South Sudan? I think it's already extremely hard, and I think donor fatigue is one of the issues that has hit South Sudan uh, in particular extremely hard with, with trying to meet the contributions necessary to provide humanitarian assistance to the South Sudanese people. As you say, millions of people, it's, it's four million people uh, who are displaced uh, either inside, internally in South Sudan, with hundreds of thousands in the protection of civilian sites, or two and a half million people outside of the country, in neighboring countries, uh, a million in Uganda. Um, what this peace deal potentially does do is give a bit more of a lift in terms of being able to uh, concretely provide for uh, humanitarian access to difficult to reach areas if it were to 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 last that is and if fighting uh, you know local fighting as well as intercommunal fighting in in many areas were to were to cease or to to to, to, to levels were to drop as a result of that um, but I think on the on the global level the difficulty will remain the challenge will be huge in trying to meet the humanitarian needs. Uh, the UN has consistently said that in the last six months or so. Um, and it's a regional challenge as much as it is a challenge in South Sudan. And um, I think the, the UN in particular and, and agencies that it has been supporting have been very overstretched. And let's not forget that uh, South Sudan being one of the worst conflicts globally, uh, we have also seen an increase in targeting of, uh, of humanitarians working in South Sudan. And that has made them, uh, rightly, of course, risk averse. Yeah, Several, Ahmed, I mean, the UN uh, the says, really the, the UN says that it's the deadliest looking... place for humanitarian workers in the world, correct? Absolutely. I think I can't remember the, the number, but over 170 killed in the last uh, two or three years. Uh, one of the deadliest places in the world, and and it and it has made uh, you know the the work of of meeting the needs of South Sudanese people who are displaced and who are vulnerable, and that's up to seventy percent of the population, um, meeting those needs extremely difficult, um, and 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 those challenges I think are likely to be ongoing for the international community. Uh, but, but as I said, there is a glimmer of hope in that if this current peace process, and, and we're talking a long, a long way ahead, uh, is able to hold, then that will at least enable uh, more solid humanitarian access to, to, to more difficult to reach areas in South Sudan. Uh, but lots, Ahmed, I, I Ahmed, think also Ahmed, really I'm sorry, important. I'm sorry to interrupt. It's just that we're, we're almost out of time. I just want to get one more question in to Dio here. Dio, you heard Ahmed speaking about the humanitarian crisis, the impact of it. I want to ask you specifically about the displacement crisis. There's over 2 million South Sudanese that fled the war in South Sudan, living in neighboring countries. What happens to them now? Do you think it will be safe for them to be able to come back? Would they want to come back? I think uh, uh, given the fact that uh, there has been, uh, um, in the past, uh, the breaking of ceasefires and agreements have not been able to hold, I think they would be very skeptical to come back immediately. Uh, there has to be some level of uh, confidence creating, and that would happen in, the, uh, in seeing that so the economy is flourishing, uh, the oil is uh, sold. And most importantly, what has been said is that uh, maybe the oil uh, and the money that is uh, generated in the economy is not the problem. The problem is how it is managed. Uh, and many of uh, 
the, the people in government in uh, South Sudan uh, have been accused of corruption and uh, diverting money that is meant for development. Deo, and that Deo is I'm meant sorry to, to interrupt to you. Change the life. Deo, it's just that we're, we're out yes. of time. We're going to have to end it there. We're out of time. Uh, gentlemen, we thank you so much for joining us. Thanks to all our guests, Deo Gumba, Ali Verji, and Ahmed Suleiman. And thank you, too, for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Mohammed Jamjoum, and the whole team here, bye for now.